are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Welcome to the final episode of Season 3, which features one of the most influential economists of our time, Daron Ashemoglu, who is the Institute Professor in the Department of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. In the best-selling book, Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity and Poverty, first published in 2012, Daron and his co-author James Robinson from the University of Chicago ask, why some nations are rich and others poor, divided by wealth and poverty, health and sickness, food and famine. They claim that it is neither culture, weather, nor geography. Rather, they argue, that economic success depends on man-made political and economic institutions. In their latest book, The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Fate of Liberty, Daron and Jim show that liberal democratic states exist in between the alternatives of lawlessness and authoritarianism. And while the state is needed to protect people from domination at the hands of others in society, the state can also become an instrument of violence and repression. Society's default condition is anarchy, or the so-called absent leviathan. The alternatives to chaos are despotism, the despotic leviathan, the powerless state, or the paper leviathan, and the shackled leviathan, or state which equals with what the book describes as the corridor between the absent paper and despotic leviathans. Thus, liberty originates from a delicate balance of power between state and society. Darun and I began by discussing the contested nature of development, the role of institutions, and how not to build a state. Thereafter, we focused on how and why the pursuit of liberty and development progresses along a narrow corridor using the examples of South Africa, China, India, the United States, and Scandinavia. We concluded by discussing the role of globalization, international trade, and the United Nations in sustaining paper Leviathan states. My team and I are absolutely thrilled to notice a significant growth in the number of listeners who regularly tune in to the show from more than a hundred countries. Please continue to send us your questions, comments and suggestions as we begin preparing for season four of the show, which we hope will air in a few months from now. Thank you and I hope you enjoy listening to my conversation with the one and only Daron Ashemoglu. Daron, I'm just so excited to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. It's a great pleasure and honor to be on your show. Let us get started with discussing something very overarching. You know, this show is about development. We're trying to understand how societies actually develop, however way we understand that concept. But Daron, as you know, the development concept is, of course, very contested. People have different understandings or visions or versions of what development means. So let me ask you right at the outset, how do you view development? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a good question because my own thinking on this has changed and there are legitimate reasons for sort of wondering what's the right sort of notion. You know, if you look at history, there are so many instances where modernization of some sort became a mantra, but then was used as a cludgeon to beat down people. So, you know, what is it really about economic development that we think is so essential and how to make that cohere with what people want and also with some sort of values perhaps that we think would be, you know, uh, 
worth pursuing yeah right worth pursuing exactly so you know i think there is broad agreement among people in developing countries at the moment that prosperity is desirable and that's what you know we start with in why nations fail that in some sense it's a failure if countries don't realize their potential in terms of prosperity but in some of the later work we're also trying to get to the nitty-gritty of you know how do you make this consistent with people's traditions existing values and how do you make it consistent with liberty and other things that perhaps they value deeply exactly so the critique of modernization was that one was advocating irrelevant western models like this preaching which by the way we still do from the global north there are certain values that we cherish and sometimes this can be seen to be dictating or or preaching to others but going back to this understanding of development and of course in your work you've been highlighting the importance of property rights different types of opportunities for economic growth in why nations fail of course you talk about the key role of economic but also political institutions and in addition to all of this Darun, you've also been concerned with how not to build a state on the one hand, of course, we know some sort of an idea of development, but also how we shouldn't proceed. And I read your work on Colombia, where you're saying that basically, you know, this kind of security first approach, the role of the military, that was just a bad idea. Because, again, going back to how we started, it's about who's doing development for whom and all of that. So Afghanistan, applying the lens of why nations fail to Afghanistan, how should we understand what we committed in terms of mistakes? Well, I think there's so many layers to your excellent questions. These are absolutely central questions. Before I come to Afghanistan, let me say something about the first part of your question. I think the sort of mod Western modernization view has been hugely problematic in every one of its versions. You know, one version, for example, that was the essence of Martin Seymour Lipset's argument that all you need to do is increase GDP, perhaps a little bit of investment in education, and everything else will come together, sort of a broad symbiotic view of all aspects of development from civil rights, rights for women, democracy, political voice. And I think it's just so completely wrong that you know, we shouldn't even waste time on it. I mean, it's completely contradicted by data, by history, by the logic of how development process takes place. But if you look at it, it still is overwhelmingly dominant in policy circles and, and even in some academic circles. What is called the modernization hypothesis, I think is, is just hugely influential still. You know, my work shows how incorrect it is both empirically and historically, but I think more needs to be done to do that. A second version that, you know, is sometimes associated with uh, Francis Fukuyama, that, you know, somehow there is an inexorable path to a Western style, liberal democracy, market mechanism, etc. The end of history, I think that again, that's been now shown to fail all sorts of recent reality tests, but it's still highly influential. But perhaps even more pernicious has been what you know the US has done in Afghanistan and other places, which is a view of modernization that is built on two pillars that are both problematic. One is that modernization is something that is good, even if people on the ground don't understand it, so you should impose it on people. And two, that it always has to start by one group, however flawed that is, having a monopoly of violence and complete control and domination over the rest of society. So we have to have a state that looks like ours. A state, first. Something like a state, although not in most of the time it's not really a state because it doesn't have many things that you know we associate with state: bureaucracy, autonomy, regulation capacity, etc. But it has coercive overwhelming course of force. And of course, it's great from the American perspective or from the European perspective, if this force is allied with the US or with themselves. And that's essentially what, you know, was the root of all the problems in Afghanistan. You know, the US went in there with the view that they were going to anoint a group, 
it happened to be Karzai and his entourage. That group was going to build a state, so a huge amount of money poured into their coffers, which, of course, got siphoned off. U.S. military was in their support, and all sorts of local grievances, local sensibilities and traditions were cast aside because either they were on the side of opposition to Karzai, therefore they were bad because the way you wanted to do this was to set up a powerful group first that was going to implement its will and the will of the United States, or they didn't know what was good for them. Like it was really good for them to send girls to school and they didn't want to send to girls to school. Therefore they had to be coerced to send girls to school. Well, I completely agree. It was, it is, it would be amazing to have more female schooling, but the perspective that, you know, people on the ground don't know what's good for them. And, you know, modernization means we teach them. I think it's going to run into trouble, obviously. Here we have a situation where we think that people want to live under what we think is the modern state. But you mentioned Fukuyama, of course, he, you know, he's a friend of mine. And I sort of see that sequencing development is being increasingly challenged and, in, you know, what comes first. But I was thinking of another person who's been my mentor, uh, Jim Scott. He says that not everybody who wants to live under a state, they want to maybe flee from the state. They don't want to be dominated. So we are assuming that in Afghanistan, there was the need for that kind of state building from the outside. We were going to impose, engineer a solution, impose these solutions on society without really perhaps understanding what society wanted. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I'm really glad you brought up James Scott's work, first of all. I'm a huge fan. I think he's had many original, crucial ideas, which he often developed with great flair. But also, I think it is very important to pit his ideas against those of Samuel Huntington and Francis Fukuyama, because I think they both have some truth, but they miss an important common set of elements. But also, I think both of them make short shift of some of the real sort of paradoxes, dilemmas here. So let me, first of all, say what I mean by it's a good sort of counterweight to Fukuyama hunting. This is exactly what you hinted at, which is that oftentimes people want to flee the state. State building has a frequently pernicious way of trying to bring order on society. So it's the complete opposite of the Huntington Fukuyama view that somehow if you set up the state, good things will eventually develop. And for James Scott, bringing the state structure is often going to lead to worse things. But, you know, both of those miss, in my opinion, the space in between. And that's both for good and bad. The space in between is for good when this sort of tension between people's avoidance and uprising against the state somehow acts as a break on the worst instincts of state builders. And that's the modus operandi of what we've called a narrow corridor that creates that space in between where new ideas, new dynamics, balances can evolve. We can talk more about that. But also I think it, it does really bypass a lot of these ethical dilemmas, which I always struggle with. You know, when people are fleeing the state, they are often doing that with traditions, norms, and mores that are quite problematic. Yeah. You know, this is what we call the cage of norms in the narrow corridor. It creates a very tight, constricting set of rules that are very unequal and sometimes very repressive. Again, women, I think, are the number one target of these norms. So they are the ones who suffer most in the cage of norms. And, you know, there are exceptions. There are absolutely exceptions of stateless societies that respect women's rights, but they are the exceptions. You know, if you look at Afghanistan, Somalia, many parts of the Balkans, you know, statelessness or resistance to the state often came with very tight restrictions, repression, violence against women, and of course, denial of women's rights to take part in economic activities, in schooling, and make decisions about themselves. But on the other hand, if you sort of go with the we're going to bring modernization view, 
you know, it creates this tension. Okay, fine, you're trying to perhaps liberate women, but what about what people on the ground can live with and how is that going to be perceived by that? So that delicate balance, I think, is one of the hardest things in Afghanistan. I mean, I think it is extremely sad to see today in Afghanistan all the advances that women made being rolled back. But it is also an indication of a failure that billions of dollars of aid, so many years of NGO work, you know, they made very little progress except in Kabul in changing people's attitudes towards gender. And, you know, that's a failure too. And and, and, and how do we start thinking about that failure? I think that's one of the, those are going to be some of the key issues for 21st century development. I had Jim on the show last year, and his key argument was, can we domesticate the state or will it domesticate us? You know, for yes. him, that really is the key thing because because of technology and stuff. You also interested in AI, automation, you know, Big Brother watching us. It's very difficult these days to actually flee the state because the state is everywhere. So that, I think, is interesting in relation to the narrow corridor, you know, whether we can domesticate it. And I, I really enjoyed reading the book because... You and, and Jim Robinson argue that this pursuing liberty, I'm pursuing development here, the pursuit of liberty and development is along that very narrow corridor, because on the one hand, you have the despotic states. You could say China is an example of that, having achieved development, but represses freedoms, etc. On the other hand, you have those lawless, absent states. You could also have in between, and we'll discuss this, the paper leviathans, which I thought was an interesting concept. But for you in this book, prosperity depends on a so-called shackled leviathan. So I've read it, but could you please explain to my listeners, what does that mean? Well, I think it follows naturally from the discussion that we had a second ago, that I think the view of Fukuyama Huntington is wrong or inadequate at the very least because it ignores first of all what people want and second it downplays the dangers that a strong state or a strong group that controls the state apparatus is going to be able to impose its will so there are there are examples in history where people become dictators or very powerful and then do good things but then that many examples. Most of the time, you know, Lord Acton was right. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that applies no more clearly to anything than state institutions. But on the other hand, if you turn back, if you turn your back on state institutions, you're going to miss out on a lot of things that we think are critical for human fulfillment and essential for the rights and desires of people peaceful resolution of disputes, opportunities, markets that can be supported, which often require some sort of state institutions, protection for the weak. Again, you know, there are traditions and norms that sometimes offer those. But if you look at no society in history has offered a type of protection for people who are economically disadvantaged, disabled, or have other impairments as, say, for example, you know, Nordic welfare states or Germany, so European welfare states. U.S. is not quite there, but, you know, by its own standards and by historical standards, U.S. offers an amazing protection for people who are unlucky or, 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 or economically unfortunate. Those things are impossible without a state. So, hence, Jim and I argue that what you need is a state, but its worst instincts are controlled, and that's where shackles come in. But critically, and we knew that from the beginning, that's why we put a lot of emphasis on this, but we don't want those shackles to be interpreted as constitutional limits. Of course, constitutions have an important role, but our argument throughout is that, in contrast to Madison or Montesquieu-type reasoning, this isn't separation of powers or constitutional limits on what sovereigns or presidents can do. It's really needs to come from society. It needs to come up from bottom-up organization 
in in various ways it needs to it could be democratic institutions but it could be village councils it could be protests it could be other types of mobilization and that's part of the difficulty that you know often when you look at traditional societies they are very imperfect in many ways but they do have their own ways of organizing resistance to rulers and often in the name of modernization you destroy those I noticed that in the book that there is this skepticism you have, and I share that, that one can't just rely on a constitution or sort of these legal frameworks to automatically generate development. You know, I've, I've studied, say, the right to food in India, and the Supreme Court in India has been very vociferous, regular hearings, all kinds of judgments issued. The trouble is the courts can issue judgments, but if the politicians don't act upon them, it doesn't mean anything. So, yes. you know, those have to be operationalized. So I, I really like this fact that you emphasize in, in the narrow corridor that the state and society have to be running together, this red queen effect, and they have to run equally fast because you can't slack off because if you do, a not so nice sort of outcome will happen. So the sweet spot then is arrived at by this constant running and trust is important, cooperation is important. I noticed that, of course, you highlight the role that, say, Nelson Mandela played in pushing South Africa on that path. But, Daron, when I go to South Africa these days, I, I don't see, for me, South Africa doesn't seem to be in that sweet spot. So am I wrong there? Have I misunderstood you? Well, you know, I think there are two issues here. We can come back to India because I think it's an excellent example, but perhaps it's not something I have to bring up in response to your current question. And of course, the fact that you know India much better than I do is a disadvantage, so we'll handle that one later. But your description was very apt, and immediately it implies that a narrow corridor is never going to be a tidy place. If we lived in a world in which, if we lived in the kind of world that Madison believed in, which is you have essentially well-meaning elites only if you can write down the right constitutional rules and those elites are going to can be made to act in constrained ways and they control the base instincts of the masses you know yeah. democracy was not a good word for madison if that was the right sort of conceptualization that could be a tidy stable world it's rule bound it's led by a small group of people who are enlightened and can constrain each other in predictable ways. So we're saying that's not realistic, that's not empirically relevant. But the alternative, exactly what bothered Madison, is that democracy is chaotic and messy, problematically rambunctious. So, you know, as a result, the corridor is often a messy place. Yeah. So that is, for example, what when the Chinese leadership looks at Europe or the US, they don't understand. They think that is a sign of weakness, the decadence of the West that the Communist Party's rule is avoiding in China. But if Jim and I are right, that is the ultimate source of strength of these sort of more bottom up institutions. Now, looked at it from that way, where does South Africa fit? Well, I don't know, because you know, South Africa, given its huge size, heterogeneity, poverty, inequality, was never going to be like a little, you know, Switzerland on the savanna. But, you know, Jacob Zuma's term did really lead to a huge increase in corruption. It's brought the worst in the ANC. It started eroding some of the trust in institutions, power of courts. But I'm actually still optimistic about South Africa. So they're still on the track. Have they moved out since you wrote the book, you think? I wouldn't say they have. I mean, a country has a huge inequality problem, huge crime problem. So it has to bring those things under control. But, you know, so does the U.S. The U.S. has a crime problem, has an inequality problem, has an incarceration problem, has a polarization problem. But I wouldn't say the U.S. has left the corridor yet. I mean, in both cases, I think there is a big risk. 
but 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 still we're we're in the in the heart of the matter right now we're in a critical juncture so to speak so daron this is messy this process we're running a marathon i suppose a state and society it's a long term thing and you have countries coming in and out of the corridors and if one let's say society can't keep up this is what i suppose some would say about india at the moment in your book of course you talk about india mainly in relation to the cage of norms cast as having constrained development and that's why there is still so much poverty but some would say that society isn't unwilling society wants to run fast with the state but in india perhaps and in other countries the state is becoming extremely innovative at creating obstacles so it's not for lack of interest in running fast but the impediments that is slowing society down so in those circumstances in india and elsewhere daron how do you think this so called red queen effect can be unleashed well i mean i think what you are describing can be understood even more sharply with the case of china you know china was has not been in the corridor for millennia certainly not recently but the existential challenge of the chinese system is how can a small group controlling the state or the communist party maintain its grip and sort of dominance over society and i think the issue has become very different over the last two decades because of advances in technology that have expanded the tools that are available for that type of control you know the chinese credit system social credit system sorry is an amazing innovation look you can say well before china google and facebook have that but you know that those that actually speaks to the current problems in the united states in my opinion yeah but it is changing that balance that we talked about and i think it is indicative of a more, more of a broader phenomenon which is that you know because the balance between state and society is very fragile when there are huge technological innovations it requires perhaps a gargantuan effort to reestablish that effort and so perhaps it's going to fail so that's i think uh something we have to grapple with in the united states in europe you know in 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 india it is it is more complex in some sense india's government does not have anything close to the control that the chinese government has or even the us government has over society but it's increasing it's increasing rapidly but i think in india there is an unusual by its own history there's an unusual degree of tolerance of malfeasance by the government that you know again i'm not a student of india but my reading is that that's not something that you see in the 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s but today modi's government i mean i was shocked for example by those nso group revelations of the pegasus software that the modi government was essentially doing the worst kind of illegal wiretaps or surveillance of all sorts of media and opposition politicians it was the worst abuser of nso technologies anywhere in the world according to the revelations and very little seems to have been done of that in india itself which is just shocking relative to you know what you would expect from india from the 80s or the 90s i buy a lot of the argument that you make about the cage of norms having shackled india's development if i can put it that way some would of course say that india actually has a very centralized state the problem is it's federal setup just like the us you know you have far too many cooks spoiling the broth and this constant tug of war between a vision of development from delhi versus in the regional aspects you could also say it's a very heterogeneous society it's diverse religion some would even say their own its geography here that matters i think the caste thing does play a role still perhaps not to the extent which you may think it does things are changing in the sense that in rural india sure you still see viral videos of this i just saw this morning a muslim woman in a burqa being chased by a mob i saw that too yes what i think is really a big problem is this lack of identity of being indian sometimes 
I don't know if you can relate to this. It could also be in the U.S. You know, it's like you're Californian. You're you're from Boston. You know that kind of stuff. So I, I think it's this kind of complex set of things that bring all of this together, not just the cage of norms. Well, what what do you think? Well, you know, a couple of things. First of all, you know, we're putting we're dancing around this issue, but there is no doubt that it's important. You know, when you look at South Africa, Brazil, India, the U.S. The development and political problems in these countries are very complex because they are so large and so heterogeneous. So in some sense, it is inevitable that India is going to have strong regional governments and strong regional imprints on its economic strategies because its, its regions are so different. And in some sense, that's been part of the success of India, that Indian democracy, despite all the criticism that it has received, has also allowed some regions to pursue better public good provision and so on. But there is a struggle in that. Modi's government is trying to exert a greater degree of control than previous governments had. The second thing I would say is you're absolutely right that you know our discussion of India was much more apt for the 60s, 70s, 80s than today, where urban areas, caste has become less important. But still, it's sort of it, it sets the scene for political interactions. And I'm not sure, again, I'm not a scholar of India, so I'm not sure how how important really it is. But I read these interviews by Indian scientists in Silicon Valley a couple of years ago. And they were fascinating because, you know, many of these people came from low caste background. And some of them had actually changed their names so that they would not be recognized. And they told these stories of other Indians from Brahmin background coming to Silicon Valley as themselves as engineers and trying to find out their background and questioning them to find out whether they were really low caste or not, because that was critical for the social hierarchy that they were expecting to set up among the Indian sub-community of Google or Facebook or whatever it is. So, you know, so again, I think Cast is dying, but it's not dying fast enough. Darun, returning to China, in the book you write that liberty with Chinese characteristics is no liberty at all. And I wondered whether one could, or if you would appreciate that, one could have some sort of economic liberty, economic freedom that the Chinese middle class, when I go to Beijing, when I teach there, they seem to be satisfied. I'm not sure whether they really are genuinely satisfied, but there's this feeling that political liberty can wait because we still have sustained economic liberty, even though one doesn't live in a democracy, etc. Shouldn't that be count for something economic liberty well it, it absolutely does count for something but you know first of all in the book we don't define liberty as you know economic liberty a la hayek for example we we try to take the more political and dominance related aspects of liberty to be more important but second you know that's exactly the the bargain that the communist party has offered to the middle classes you know, in China, there is a recent history of famine, hunger, economic hardship, insecurity, fear. And, you know, the Communist Party offered a bargain, which is, especially after Tiananmen Square, we're going to keep a very tight control, prevent any sort of political action that in other countries would be expected from the middle class in return for economic security. And, you know, in some sense, Perhaps if things could be frozen in the way that they were in the 1990s, we could debate about whether that's desirable or not. I think it's an ethical issue. It's a normative issue. It's a philosophical issue. But I don't think you can keep things frozen in their, in the way that they were in the 1990s, where the uh, when the so the iron grip of the Communist Party was strong but was not completely stifling. You know, today we're moving more and more towards complete control of the Communist Party with facial recognition cameras everywhere, all sorts of data being collected, no room for any type of dissent. 
you know, uh, according to, was it New, New, New York Times or The Guardian? I forget now. Uh, but one of their investigative journalists uh, calculated that last year, tens of millions of plane and train, high-speed train trips were not allowed because people had too low social credit. You know, that isn't the economic security and economic liberty we're talking about, and it's an inevitable stage of this totalitarian control. So, which brings me then to the issue of liberty, and you mentioned that, that the kind of definition or the approach you take. I'm thinking about Isaiah Berlin, his sort of famous distinction between positive freedom, negative freedom, negative as in the freedom of interference, mm -hmm. and positive as in all the opportunities, capabilities, to use Amartya Sen's approach to all the stuff that we really can do and want to do. So. What kind of freedom or liberty do you see? And I was struggling to understand that actually in the book. Is it mainly the positive kind that you are highlighting? Well, you know, that's why I'm a huge fan of Isaiah Berlin. But I always thought the positive versus negative was an amazingly useful way of thinking about problems, but also was too rigid. And perhaps we should have gotten into that dis discussion and this uh, sort of clarified it more. But the reason why we go with Philip Pettit's definition, which I'll repeat here, is because we wanted to chart a middle ground between positive and negative. Mm -hmm. and there's no doubt that the negative freedoms that Isaiah Berlin discusses or delineates are minimal. They are very, very important. They're critical, but they are also minimal in the sense that they're not sufficient. But the positive, I think, may have a way of becoming too expansive. So for that reason, we think the definition that Philip Pettit suggested, which is the ability of individuals to avoid dominated, being dominated, or avoid dominances is critical. So that doesn't mean that it's enough to be free that you're allowed to do what you want. If you are allowed to do what you want, but at the same time, somebody has huge power over you economically, culturally, socially, that's not freedom. So the cage of norms is not a freedom if it's internalized. Like imagine the following situation. We talked about the cage of norm. In one society, women have no rights. They have to do the cooking, the dishes. They cannot go out of the house because they are coerced. If try to, they try to do that, their husband or their cousins are going to beat them up. In the neighboring village, it's exactly the same thing, but women have completely internalized that. And they don't even try to go out. Are they free in the second one? No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that, despite the fact that in the second one, we can say, oh, they are free because nobody's preventing them from doing so. No, because that internalization has happened with overwhelming power and dominance over them. In the same way, you're not free if you are afraid that your family can go hungry, and therefore you feel you have to do everything your boss says, that you can never object, you can never express your opinion, your under constant fear that your boss is going to fire you. So you're not free in that situation. So economic opportunities, economic security is critical. But you see, this is I'm not defining this as a positive freedom. I'm not defining this as you have a positive right to a TV. I think that's meaningless. That's That really is counterproductive. But it is also insufficient, in my opinion, to go with a sort of a Hayekian or the negative. You know, if you have the ability to be let alone by the government, you're free. That's also, that's also not true. So in some sense, FDR, despite all his faults, actually got that right when he talked of the, you know, freedom from the huge needs that people have. I wrote a PhD thesis many moons ago, and I was looking at Amartya Sen's notion of public action, you know, famine prevention in mm -hmm. India, looking at democracy development. And... In relation to that, I was thinking in your book, you don't really talk so much about democracy. There's a preference for liberty. And here's my take on it. And you can tell me if this is why you chose liberty and not democracy, because liberty is about a wider set of issues. So you could have some form of freedom, even though you live in a non-democracy. That's part of it. Exactly. It's more sort of, we think, we argue that autonomy the ability to make decisions, not to be dominated, not to be threatened, is a basic human desire. And also democracy, if you define it narrowly as Western democracy, is too narrow. If you look at history, 
there are so many other ways in which people can participate in politics, from petitions to bottom-up protests, from assemblies to village councils. I think, you know, trying to sort of create a dichotomy, you know, I'm a huge fan of democracy. I think democracy is the future, and I think we have to double down on democracy, don't get me wrong. But from the historical way, and especially in the context of economic development, to say it's democracy or nothing is not enough, and it ignores all of these indigenous methods that people have developed in order to keep their rulers under check. When we look at the narrow corridor, I love the, the cover of this version. Oh, thank you. That's the British version. Yes, I got it from Amazon.uk, so that explains it. You are, of course, a fan of the Scandinavian model, and Sweden comes up quite often in the book. And there's one thing that I thought, I don't know if you're aware of this, that could be of interest. How is it that state and society are running at the same time? and equally fast, how is that checks and balance being undertaken on a daily basis? And there's something here, Daron, I don't know if you're aware, called the law of Yante, Yante Lovin. And it's based on this, uh, this satirical piece by a Danish-Norwegian author called Axel Sandemose. And it denotes this attitude of disapproving expressions of individuality, which you have much more in the U.S., and personal success. So, you know, we have the Olympics going on in Beijing. So the typical expression of this would be, if I win the gold medal and I've worked for four years, I've done you know everything right, when I'm interviewed on TV, I'm not supposed to say, I deserve it and I'm good, I'm number one. You're supposed to be modest and tone it down. And some would call this false modesty, but this idea that don't think that you're someone, you know? Don't think that you're better than us. And I think there's something there that keeps that Scandinavian model. I mean, this varies across Scandinavia. In Norway, you're not supposed to say you're the best. Others can say so. And so this applies to politicians. They can't get too powerful. We always want to make sure that everybody, even the royal family, should be like us. You know, I think it's the same is true as actually in Britain. You know, that was one of the things that, you know, is a shock when you come from Britain to the U.S. You know, you think there's so much parallel between the... But in Britain, except on this year, you're Boris Johnson, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, singing your own praises is like completely unacceptable. Everybody would make fun of you. You'd be ridiculed. And in the U.S., that's acceptable. So if you look at Scandinavia, you know, I think it is really an amazing mix of, but it's too good to be true, I'll tell you that also, but it's an amazing mix. You know, when people hear of individualism, you have two different contradictory thoughts that come to people's mind. One is, you know, people in, are individualistic, so they pretend, they, they, they maintain their freedom, they're not being driven by the herd, but at the same time, then they don't invest in community. So in the US, you have the second kind of individualism quite strong, you know, it's like the whole sort of quasi-libertarian attitude of Silicon Valley, disruption, we don't care about anything. That That is a child of that second aspect of individualism. In Scandinavia, you know, by, if you look at surveys, people are very individualistic, but at the same time, they are very respectful of institutions, community, sort of a sense of trying to restrain your selfish behavior for the good of the community. So I think achieving that is a huge, huge achievement, huge accomplishment. But, you know, it's not, people sometimes say, oh, that's the Scandinavian culture. Well, it certainly wasn't like that 100 years ago. Scandinavia was among the most unequal places, agrarian society completely elite dominated. So it's something that, that has been institutionally achieved. That forging of the alliance. That forging of the alliance. And you see that in the economy as well. It is a private property-based economy. Firms are innovative, but there's a lot of rent sharing. There's a lot of acceptance that you're not going to trample on other people, but in a way that still respects firms' incentives and innovation. But there are two pillars of this that are critical, and there are two pillars of this that are lucky for Scandinavia, and those two lucky pillars, I don't know where they're going to go in the future. The two pillars that are critical was that Scandinavia built amazingly good 
state institutions in conjunction with you know the trade union movement and, and other things so those state institutions really bolstered it and via a series of reforms and fortuitous changes it also flattened out huge wealth inequalities so from the finland to norway and sweden you know uh, economic inequality that was very, very high at the beginning of the 20th century sort of came down over time. So, you know, there are very rich people, very rich businesses in, in Sweden, for example, but but there is a limit on that. And that, that sort of maintains some degree of limit on the power of the very rich, even though they are still motivated by international profits and so on. But there are also two dimensions of the Scandinavian model that enable them to achieve these things in a rather easy way. One is that Scandinavia sort of really benefited from the U.S. U.S. provided both international security for Scandinavian countries, so they did not have to have a militarized state against Russian threat, etc. And also, the United States created a much more cutthroat form of capitalism at home that then allowed Swedish firms to benefit from the innovations in those countries and the markets in those countries. So Swedish firms could be still very innovative, but but adhere by the rules of the social welfare state. So if you if you think of an economy that just consisted of Scandinavia, Norway, and Denmark, I don't know how that would have looked like. The second aspect is homogeneity. Yes. So you know we've danced around this issue from the earlier in India, Brazil, U.S., South Africa. They have a huge heterogeneity problem, both ethnically culturally, economically, and all of these countries, again, inequality was high at early on, but it started coming down. So they are economically somewhat homogeneous, culturally quite homogeneous, ethnically homogeneous. And you're seeing the problems in Sweden after the, the fraction of the population with immigrant origin has increased, you know, politics has become much more contentious. You know, Swedish Democrats, you know, you had no party like that for over 100 years, and now they're one of the strongest parties in the country. So so I think how they're going to navigate, and, you know, think of the problem in the U.S. U.S. politics is so racial, so uh, interwoven with anti-immigrant feelings, so heterogeneous between South, North, West, you know, all of these difficulties, you know, Scandinavian countries avoided. So it's it's great for me to have Scandinavia as an example of what we can achieve. But of course, I know it's a little bit vacuous to also say U.S. should emulate Denmark. I mean, you know, that's that's really much easier said than done. Daron, a final set of issues, the, the case of the paper Leviathans, because, you know, my show is often about many of these countries on the African continent, in Asia, Latin America, that has a state, but the state is doing its best to thwart society, keeping society down. In the book, you talk about Nkrumah in Ghana and some of the stuff that the so-called paper Leviathans do. So here, I wonder what the future holds. I'm thinking about globalization, international trade, geopolitics in sustaining some of these paper leviathans. I'm thinking about, you even write about the UN, how the UN confers legitimacy on people like Bobby Mugabe, you know, becoming a goodwill ambassador when he himself goes to Singapore, or he used to when he was alive, for treatment. So what, what is the way forward in this sort of day and age we live in, Daron, for these paper leviathans? Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great topic for us to end on uh, because I think it's so expansive. And uh, so, you know, if you go back to our discussion of James Scott versus Huntington Fukuyama, it seemed a little bit dichotomous, right? You either have don't have the state, in which case you get the autonomy, you can flee the state, you don't have to give up your traditions, your some of your basic liberties to the state, but you miss out on all of the services. Or you get the repression of the state, but in return you get some public goods like you do in China or, you know, Russia and so on. Well, the paper leviathans are the exception, meaning that you get the worst of both worlds. So you have strong looking states in the sense that they have a security apparatus that can be quite repressive, that can go around and kill people. But its ability to do things is rather limited beyond repression. 
and its ability to project its power beyond the capital is very limited where the country needs most help often. So as a result, you don't get regulations that are useful, dispute resolution doesn't work, public goods are completely absent, crime or even non-state actors proliferate. And as a result, these are leviathans that look strong, but that are actually paper thin. And we argue in the book that these have many causes, many origins, but colonialism is a very important part of it because colonial powers bolstered the, the sort of the scaffolding of the state in the capital without really making the inside of it very strong and certainly had no interest in projecting power beyond the capital and the places that had natural resources. And elites. And the elites, exactly. The indirect rule was all about that. And then the in international state system, that was, of course, Hobbes's brainchild, but has become much more of a sort of a reality in the 20th century or the second half of the 20th century, really clamors to recognize states and politicians, so gives them legitimacy. So UN would, wouldn't know what to do if you didn't have a state representative. It just needs to reaffirm its existence. You know, by the way, I'm a huge fan of the UN in general, but this particular role of the UN has been terrible. Because it confers domestic legitimacy, right? Exactly. And then it, it tries to increase their domestic legitimacy because it doesn't know what else to do. And then these rulers, of course, many of them in sub-Saharan Africa, but some in Latin America or South Asia, then viciously exploit this legitimacy that they get conferred from international organizations, just like Robert Mugabe did. Jerome, perhaps you would be willing to come back on the show at some point when you finish another book. It was such a pleasure to see you and thank you so much for coming on my show today. Thank you for inviting me, Dan. Yes, I would love to add our new book is out, April, May 2023. And what's the title? What's the preliminary title? Well, it's about how we are misusing technology. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.